I guess the second question would be, um, I would love to have more conversations about that. I just don't know how, and I don't want to feel awkward about it right. uh, or embarrassed, you know, at the same time. And if anybody can help sort of facilitate or guide me, that would be very appreciative. But I would think in a comfortable setting too, yes. um, like the one we're having. I mean, I've, uh, you've invited uh, me here a number of times. We've known each other even prior to um, having this conversation, like you said, when we first met. So I think part of it too is being comfortable about both maybe the surroundings and the circumstances uh, so that you can open up uh, more freely about that. Yes. And part of it, I think it, it's a posture of listening. You know, just tell me your experience. Tell me your point of view. Uh, tell me what has happened to you. Tell me what you value. I think when you can approach another person from that kind of humble stance of listening, um, it's tremendously inviting. and someone feels free and confident in such an environment to be able to really share something that's very deep and true. And in that listening and in that offering, you know, we, we start to weave relationships where we realize what unites us transcends what, what's different and that we find that unity in Christ and in our, our common humanity. And that's really the vision, right? Yeah. Bishop, but, I have one, uh, Maybe tough question for you, um, and you can help me answer this. I think, but let me ask you this: We let me set it up by saying this to you. We all have, whether we want to admit to it or not, or many of us. Let's just say that, but it's probably all of us. But many of us have our own implicit unconscious bias. I mean, and research has shown uh, that's by and large due to our upbringing, our experiences, and even our own view. Uh, on things. So we all come, and I have it. I'll make this easy confession. I have my own um, unconscious uh, and implicit bias uh, about uh, people in general, too. Um, that being said, then the question becomes, how, how should we judge? So we hear the question, you know, who am I to judge, you know, from a, a biblical standpoint? But then the question is, how, how should I judge uh, someone else? I mean, because I think also, research has shown there's actually some good reasons uh, to judge. It's just sort of something innately inside of us, you know, out of fight or flight. If you sense, you know, danger for whatever the reasons, you know, your senses sort of go up uh, and you're more acutely aware. Um, but how do we really get to appropriately trying to judge, you know, that fellow human being uh, in, in front of us? That's a very good question, especially in light of gospel for mass today today's june 22nd and the gospel is um do not judge others or the judgment you use will be judged against you or the measure you use will be measured out to you and talks about the the speck in your brother's eye and mm -hmm. the plank in your own and something i've found um, both as priest and bishop is so often when i come to understand the background of a human being of a fellow brother or sister it helps explain why they do what they do or why they think what they think. And that may not always justify um, bad behavior, but it, but it helps me understand this is why this person is doing this because of something that happened in their life. And so often, I think when we judge, we're not looking at the totality of how this person was formed mm -hmm. or not formed, mm -hmm. depending what it is. So I think on the one hand we can look at objective behavior and say this behavior matches what God would want of us or this behavior doesn't or this this is a righteous act or this is sinful. But the church would always say as well that there's a subjectivity to the guilt or the culpability of the person based on how free they are to make that decision or to embrace that action. So I'd always say that yeah, as a Christian, as a Catholic, I would say the, the gospel, the teachings of the church are the measure of how we're asked to judge. That I can judge behavior, but that doesn't mean I judge the person in terms of his or her worth. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's a distinction that's lost today. You know, mm -hmm. that I can, I can judge something particular that I'm doing or somebody else is doing. That doesn't mean I'm totally indicting that person. 
or saying that you know they're not worthy of my respect or my love. In fact, maybe the most loving thing we can do sometimes is to challenge people you know, with the fullness of the, of the truth of Christ. But I'd say the measure of judgment is Christ himself. But in the end, only God can really judge another person. Mm -hmm. I, I only see this much of what mm -hmm. that person is about. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I would say that. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, nice. But um, It's good advice for a lot of people, actually. Yeah. Well, I think if we just listened more and judged less, you know, I think of that for me, too. It's just yeah. so often I'm ready to rush in with my opinion, or if I just sat back and listened first, maybe it would help me have a better opinion mm -hmm. of the matter. Right. But, but yeah. I, go no, ahead. But, oh, yeah. I was just going to say, and then I think speaking of the value of, of maybe not prejudging um, someone uh, so that their uh, destiny is then uh, defined for them. Right. I mean, I think that sort of part of that, a lot of people don't know this, and I'm not even sure I shared this with you, um, Bishop, um, but I will. Um, you know, my, my, when I was born, my mom um, was a teen mom uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, unmarried, uh, my dad was uh, around the corner, um, and she lived with me um, in um, uh, what they affectionately call the projects, uh, I guess, uh, today, um, and in South Carolina with her mom um, and her two sisters. And all of her brothers had just moved out of the house uh, right. by that time. Um, and my uh, mom and dad ended up subsequently um, getting married about 18 months uh, later and still married uh, to this uh, very day. Um, but during that time when it was just my mom and her sisters and my grandma and my grandmother worked uh, during the day and my mom worked during at night so they could swap off mm -hmm. child yeah. coverage, you know, really taking care of me mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Um, but I remember this. I didn't, what I remember about the whole thing, I don't remember you know, how difficult and challenging life might, might have been, I can only imagine uh, really uh, now, because they didn't have much, um, you know, uh, growing up um, until my, both my mom and dad, you know, made something better their way of life and, you know, subsequently moved out um, to um, a better part of town together once they got married. Um, but one thing I do remember is my um, grandmother, every time she would put me to bed. She would uh, quote uh, Jeremiah 29 11. Um, and it wasn't until I got older, you know, and then I started uh, reading the good book she called it for myself, uh, that I quickly went to that chapter. Um, but then the book of Jeremiah became one of my favorite books of all. And I even named my firstborn child, his middle name is Jeremiah wow. uh, for that reason. Uh, but as I read it, and I know you know this all too well, but this gets to predestiny. It was really God who said in the first chapter, I believe, before I formed you in the womb, I knew thee. And I thought that was just so powerful because I, I honestly thought, as God is my holy witness, when I read it, I said, I'm not alone. Like, regardless of the circumstances around me and challenges, I, I knew there was somebody who knew me. Uh, deep down inside. I might be the only one, you know, with this DNA, but I knew that one person above knew me. And I think I found it then interesting that it made 2911 even more, it gave it more sense to me because this person who knew me even before I was in the womb, so I was designed for a certain reason, then it gets answered in 29, actually 28 chapters later, to me it gets answered, you know, um, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil. Uh, plans for you to prosper and grow. Um, and so that always sort of gave me some other confidence um, that I'm supposed to ultimately do the right thing. You know, I'm supposed to try to help uh, help other people, um, uh, quite frankly. Um, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, during this discussion that we're having now around race, if we cannot sort of prejudge someone just the way they look or they sound or even how much money they have or don't have and get to the content of that character yes. and the spirit inside, 
uh, maybe we can find ways where they could uh, prosper and grow. Well, that God loved us before we even were brought into existence. And that he has a plan for our life and a dream for us. And that you knew that even as a little boy. Or that, that God loved you absolutely. And that your life had this absolute significance. And that your mother welcomed the life within her and, yes. and gave that life to you and to the world. And that you've carried that with you your whole life, man. I mean, just think of the power of that. Yeah, if we could just help each person to see that, the truth of Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So no one is here by accident. No one's a mistake. No one's a burden. You know, that, that each one of us is a beloved child of God. Right? I look forward to more conversations. Yes. Later. So um, this is just the beginning. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here and just for your your beautiful openness and, and goodness. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. No, thanks, Dean.